All right, we're here at Taylor English Duma talking about litigation fundamentals, also known as Quillian's Kernels. I'm Henry Quillian. I'm a partner at Taylor English Duma, and the purpose of this presentation and this discussion is to help lawyers who are practicing out in the state of Georgia to know more about uh, civil procedure and how they might go about accomplishing a trial. And uh, to the extent you're not a lawyer, uh, you need to be warned that you should get one probably. And uh, we are not, however, sharing legal advice. We're only giving guidance as to where you might go to find legal advice or things you might want to think about if you're trying to do a trial on your own. Uh, obviously, as lawyers, we encourage people to use lawyers uh, for their legal work. Uh, today, the topic is voir dire, and uh, that's the process by which a jury is obtained for purposes of hearing, in this case, a civil jury trial. Uh, the right to a jury trial is embedded in our state constitution and with some limitations also in the federal constitution. And uh, it's a situation where we hope to have as part of a jury trial, people who are our peers ultimately deciding questions of fact arising out of the lawsuit and whatever's in dispute. And the general idea is to take power away from uh, you know, a limited number of judges who may come to the court under uh, circumstances where they could be placed in by a politician and also to distribute the, the justice system out into the uh, general populace so that it provides assurances to litigants that it's going to be a fair trial. Now, what is often not thought about a whole lot is how do we get to the point where we have those people sitting in the box who listen to a trial? And a lot of people think about picking a jury that the lawyers get to somehow go out in the world and find people they pick for their jury. Well, it's not that way, basically. Uh, the way it is, is people come to the court who get there under a particular mechanism, and the lawyers get to get rid of some of the ones that they don't want to have on the jury, and hopefully end up with people on the jury that are satisfactory for the purposes of the case at hand. I don't know how, how to better put it. Where do we get, and this is a question that the microphone will be needed for, and who has the microphone? Natalie, it'll need to be handed to Brent and turned on. Who knows uh, where the group of people from which lawyers get to strike the jury from is derived within a county in Georgia. If you can raise your hand, take the mic. Well, we got somebody. <laughs> From voters? Uh, these are people, that, they, this is not an amplification, it's a recording. So uh, the voter, voting list that is maintained by the county is the pool from which jurors are drawn. Uh, so if you register to vote in a county in Georgia, it should not be too terribly long before you get asked to come down to the court to serve as a potential juror. And uh, how, does, how do we get the jurors from their houses or their work into the court? We, we, uh, we get a summons, the court sends out a summons to the jurors, potential jurors, mails it to them and says show up on this date at this time in this court uh, to serve as a juror. Now, my son, who's in college, got a jury summons when we were out of town this weekend. And of course, it's gonna be during sometime when he's in college and he's gonna have to deal with that because he doesn't even go to college in the state of Georgia. But that's how the jurors are, the potential prospective jurors are drawn down to the court. Now, if you ever go to Fulton County or some other, DeKalb, some other, you'll see huge, huge groups of people that are called in to be jurors. Uh, and does every one of those go to be selected, potentially selected for every single trial that's happening that week? No. no. Uh, 
Basically, the jury clerk sorts not by use of uh, any sort of criteria other than just probably random selection, at least that's the way it's supposed to be, groups of people uh, to go to certain courtrooms for purposes of being potentially uh, chosen or selected or struck, not struck, uh, to serve on a jury in a particular type of case. So, for instance, if you had a very, very uh, well-known case, or a criminal case where the defendant is uh, the mayor of a town, uh, are you going to have, do you think the jury clerk is going to select more people to go down to be st potentially stricken so as to result in a jury or fewer people? More. More, all right. <laughs> when in doubt, though, read the rules, right? Uh, but the general idea is you've got to have, at the end of the day, enough people who can say, and uh, credibly so, that they are impartial for purposes of determining the facts at issue. So if you have uh, somebody that's either a really egregious situation that's been on the news and all this other stuff, or somebody who's really famous, then you're going to have to have a huge group of people from whom, uh, from which the the lawyers in the case will strike off jurors who have, uh, in their minds, various problems acting as jurors for the case. And, uh, but for a typical civil case, let's say we're in state court and no extra effort has been made to get a jury larger than the minimum, how many jurors are you going to end up that are actual jurors in the jury box for your trial. Any, any hands? Six, right? If, if no effort is made by anybody to do anything other than the, sta uh, than the basic amount, if you're in this, the courts that are called the state court of such and such county, you're going to have six jurors. But a lot of jurors, a lot of times a defendant will make a demand for a trial of, by 12 jurors, which would turn it into 12 jurors. In the superior courts, you automatically have 12 jurors. Everybody in agreement with that? Yeah. If you file, all right. So, uh, but then you also, typically, the judge will set it up so you have alternative <coughs> jurors in the box. And uh, under 911, OCGA 91147, the judge is given the, the opportunity to allow additional what are called alternative jurors or alternate jurors to sit and listen to the trial, and that's to protect against the circumstance where people may disappear from, the, from their, their ability to serve as a juror, particularly if it's a long trial. Now, we recently had a trial where we, where we were suing people that were well-known in the community. The judge summoned 720 people to come down as potential jurors. For whatever reason, only 140 showed up, uh, but the problem was it was a super long jury trial. And at the very beginning, this is not in the state of Georgia, but it would be handled somewhat similarly because I've gone down to serve as a juror for a trial that was well, you know, very well publicized and all that, and I was one of those huge mass number of people. Uh, the judge asked the jury, you know, how many people cannot serve five weeks for a trial? And do you think a lot or a few people <laughs> raised their hands? A lot. <laughs> okay. So a whole lot of people raised their hands. I think that took the, the 140 down to 42. Uh, and this is, in that instance, was to try to get a jury of eight with four alternates. Uh, and so what happens is somebody makes a judgment call as to how many prospective jurors are going to be needed for this trial given all, everything that the court knows about the trial. They draw a lot of people down there using summons. The jury clerk sends those people to the uh, courtroom, usually with preliminary instructions about what it's like to serve as a juror and, and what, how important it is to the Constitution and to the judicial system and all that. And then uh, that group of people is known as the what? The veneer, right? 
And so now it's the lawyer's <clears throat> burden, and it is a burden, in fact it's a hair pulling burden, to try to figure out how to get to a jury that is going to be able to decide this case in a manner that's hopefully fair and impartial, and if not fair and impartial, totally partial to your client, <laughs> right? And so, uh, and, the, and the trick is doing that in a way when you got all these people in the room where you do not tick off the people that are ultimately going to be your jury. Obviously, you want uh, the jury that's actually going to decide the case to be so, at least equally balanced in your favor as opposed to the other side. Uh, and you do not want to, in the process of getting rid of the other people, uh, make them mad so they'll hate you from the beginning. So how do you go about doing that? Well, first of all, the judge is going to give you a certain amount of guidance. But if you've got, tw let's, just, let's assume a simple situation where you got, you have to end up with 12 jurors in the box. And the judge says, you've got 24 people here from whom those 12 might result. How do we get from 24 to 12 and assume in this instance there are no alternate jurors? What's the process? We got a hand up over here. Each side would probably have six strikes. Yes, strikes. What is a strike? Do you just take them out with your fist? <laughs> throw it? No, it means you ask them questions and based on the responses to those questions, you submit that you don't want this particular person to be a juror. Aha, uh -huh. <laughs> questions. What is the process of questioning the juries called? It's a... Voir dire. Voir dire, voir dire, okay. Uh, so that's the process, the voir dire is the process of questioning the jurors to try to find, figure out as a lawyer on behalf of your client mainly who you, what you can find out about the potential witnesses but also find out what you know you want to know about why you don't want them as a juror. Why? Because as Chantel has said, you have to strike them. You have to get rid of the ones you don't want as opposed to having the opportunity to pick the ones you do want. However, it is a game, and it's a game you can play to try to get the ones that you do want by not striking them and not having the other side strike them. So it's pretty tricky. Now, when you get down there, you're going to have a, a list, uh, some sort of information on the jurors, and it's going to be relatively little. Sometimes it's only name and address possibly a spouse's name, possibly not, possibly the person's uh, employment, possibly not, and possibly the spouse's employment, possibly not, possibly uh, how much, uh, you know, how many children they have or other life circumstances, possibly what they read and what they don't read, like a question like, do you read any magazines? If so, which ones? Uh, but it's going to be fairly minimal uh, information. If it's a criminal trial, they might ask in advance, the jury cl clerk might ask the potential jurors to fill out a questionnaire about what do you feel about uh, law enforcement personnel? Uh, do you think they're needed in society and things like that? Try to give the, the lawyers some idea where these people are coming from. So uh, if you've got a really long trial, what's one of the things you have to worry about concerning your jury. They're bored. Yes, they can get bored, so, and, it, and if, illness. What happens, because what happens if you lose your jurors during the trial? If you end up with less than the constitutionally required number of jurors because of illness? What happens if you lose your jurors because they're bored? <laughs> you might lose the case, right? Or, and so you, so, the, so you have to look at a whole bunch of factors. You need to get jurors that actually will listen to your case and hopefully not to the other side's case uh, and not get bored during your case at least and then be able to make a decision that's hopefully in your favor. Uh, and so 
but you got to look at the overall circumstance. How do I get from the point of having no trial and no jurors all the way to the point of I've got enough jurors in the box on the last day to make the decision without having a mistrial? So uh, let's talk about some of the ways that this comes about. So you, usually you get there and the judge will have a few basic questions that the judge will go ahead and ask the jurors after giving them a big speech about how important they are and why and we're glad they came, etc. cetera. Uh, and those, those may be more substantive or less substantive, totally depending on the judge. Sometimes judges like con take control and ask a whole lot of questions. Uh, does anybody have a circumstance where they've had a judge that just sort of took control of the circumstance and wanted to, to guide the whole, Randy, if you'll use the microphone. Yeah, each judge has his own method of, of conducting voir dire and, and they're allowed to do it based on how they think uh, the voir dire should be conducted. Many times judges will let the lawyers do it because they were lawyers, but there are judges that want control and they'll ask you to submit questions. I think one of the first things that any lawyer ought to do is to call the judge's clerk and say, how does the judge conduct voir dire, unless you've been before that judge before, and what kind of questionnaire will you get ahead of time, what information will you get about the jurors, does the judge have time limits for the voir dire and all that so that you can prepare um, uh, to meet the, that judge's standards. Right. Uh, it does not do you any good to have a plan that is totally not in consonance with what the judge's plan is. Because whose plan is going to win? <laughs> the judge's. Uh, and hopefully you can also pe uh, pester the judge during a pretrial conference about how this is going to be done, who's going to be asking what, what opportunity am I going to have to uh, uh, actually ask these jurors, how many days do you have set out or how many hours? for us to uh, get down to the jury we're ultimately going to put into the box. And the judge will likely give you a hint. If you have a five-week trial and they say, we should be taking our first testimony by noon the first day, and you've got 48 jurors, you know, people on the veneer, you better anticipate you're not going to be able to ask very many questions. So, but let's assume for this purpose that we've got a reasonable amount of opportunity to actually go about the duties as a lawyer uh, of trying to get a jury that we want in the, in the box. Uh, and that's actually, in my view, my experience is a pretty rosy uh, circumstance. My general uh, experience has been that judges try to, because they have all these jurors waiting around who are people that might vote for them down the road that they want to cram the situation of Wadir down your neck and give the lawyers very hair pulling, uh, you have to make quick decisions uh, without much information uh, and get the jury's trial started. And I think that's unfortunate because the, the lawyers will know little about who the jurors are, the jurors will know little about who the lawyers are and it's uh, driven by time consciousness and not by uh, justice. But let's assume we, we do have some, an opportunity to actually pull this off with some sort of orderly fashion. Randy's already mentioned, you know, let's say, assume you know in the advance that you're going to have 24 jurors on the veneer, potential jurors, and that you're going to have an opportunity to do fairly broad questioning of these jurors. How should you go about doing it? Uh, an idea is, and we're going to have a role play here in a minute, but an idea that I've pursued is the thought that the juror is never going to know who you are unless you communicate it during voir dire in some form or fashion. Because the judge is going to say, to the jury, probably one of the first questions the judge will ask is, this is Mr. X and this is Ms. Y. Do you know them? They're the attorneys for the parties. If the jury says no, that's all they're going to know about you. They're only going to know it from the judge saying, this is Mr. X and this is Ms. Y. Uh, so if you want the jury to know something about you, humanize yourself, then you can take the opportunity to do that during voir dire. And one way of doing that is you can explain what you're going to be doing in the process of 
coming up with a jury in a way that incorporates something about you and your life uh, while you're explaining it to the jury. And also explaining to them that it's not a, this is a function you have to undertake. You're not doing this because to be mean and asking questions to be mean and to pry into their personal life. You're doing it because you represent a client over here uh, who you have a duty to represent. So for instance, uh, you can say, you know, we, uh, we're going to be, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I'm Henry Quillian, I'm from Atlanta, I've got, I'm a trial lawyer and I represent, and you can introduce your clients, your trial team, and we have the desire and the need to have you participate in the decision making process in this case because the law uh, provides for us to have a jury of our peers and we, our clients believe that's a valuable way for a case to be determined. I am, uh, you know, I like so. My client uh, am a father, and have and uh, I, I'm concerned about the jury system. Uh, you know, I have a child that goes to uh, the school down the street here, and would like to see this. Uh, you know, uh, people of my peers decide these this situation for my client. You can try to work some of your personal circumstances and uh, some things about you into the uh, questioning. Uh, it would have to be thought out in advance how you're going to do that and what opportunities you have to insert some of that situation. But if, if you do not have, if you do not take advantage of the opportunity to let the jury know a little bit about you during that time period, then no other time period am I aware of during the course of the trial that you're going to be able to tell them anything about you. You'll be the mystery person. Uh, so uh, once you ask these questions, and it can be anything, you can ask, uh, you know, have you ever been arrested? What did you feel about that? Do you feel like you should have been arrested or not? You can ask, uh, you, know, you know, if it's a medical malpractice case involving a, uh, a, uh, a baby that was born way prematurely, allegedly because the doctor did something wrong, you can certainly ask the jurors, have they ever had a similar circumstance? Have you ever had a miscarriage? Uh, did you blame it on the doctor? Do you think it's just part of the, uh, the way that uh, you know, biology works? Uh, you can try to find out whether they're going to hold some prejudice so strongly that it might come out adverse to your client. Uh, and if, they, if you can sh show through the questioning and come to a belief that you don't want that juror because there is some very, very strong reason why this juror should not be on the, on the ultimate jury panel, then you can ask the judge to strike that person for cause. And that has uh, got to be a pretty strong reason for most judges to allow you to strike a juror. But, you also can exercise what Chantel was talking about, peremptory strikes, which are basically, if I look at this whole group of people, uh, I don't like this person as much as I'm like that one that's three people down the list uh, outside of the initial 12, and so I'm going to strike this person in hopes of getting the person that's at, at uh, seat number 15 into the, the jury box, and that's called a peremptory strike. And both sides, is, 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 you know, ultimate, after you've questioned the jurors, ultimately the judge just goes back and forth and allows uh, the parties to implement strikes, which are called peremptory strikes, to get rid of the jurors that aren't going to be the jurors. And the ones that are left are the jurors. So there's some game playing going on because Normally it's the first 12 that come in that are going to be the jurors unless uh, people are struck along the way out of those 12. And if they're struck, then the, the ones that are further back in the pack are going to move into the jury box. So uh, Natalie and I have a little role play here uh, that we're going to go about. about she's going to be a prospective juror, and uh, we're going to... Just ask, I'm just going to ask some questions as a lawyer, and remember we have to stay in this sort of 
realm right here uh, to this perspective juror and let's see where it goes all right so she's already filled out a questionnaire I know her name uh, I know that uh, she's married that's all I know uh, and let's say we have a case that involves I'm representing the plaintiff and it's a fraud case uh, and one of the defenses is that the defendant did not reasonably, the plaintiff uh, did not justifiably rely on the representations of the defendant. So, Ms. Mark, uh, I understand you're married. Can you tell me what your doctor, your husband does as a live, for a living? <laughs> um, he's a doctor. Uh, now, uh, do you believe that... Uh, Patients should believe everything he says when they come in and he gives the diagnosis. Yes. Uh, so you don't, do you believe that it's, there's any burden on behalf of a patient to question the doctor's determination of what he's telling them? No, I think doctors are just unusual people who just seem to know a lot and I think that normally whatever advice they give you is accurate. Uh, and you would, would you think the same thing about a high-level uh, businessman who's in the business profession who's giving uh, information out to the public for purposes of spending their money? Um, I think so, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, now, I will tell you that there's a witness in this case who uses, who's in the state of Georgia, is using medical marijuana to solve what they believe is a medical issue of theirs. Uh, would you be able to fairly impart and impartially listen to the testimony of that witness and to believe them to be credible? I'm glad you asked me that. I actually have um, strong feelings about the use of marijuana and I, um, just don't think that I could trust anybody who takes marijuana. Um, yeah, I think I just have a really hard time trusting anything that they say. Um, and I don't care if they have medical problems. We all have medical problems. Um, it's just, you know, it's just, it's just something that, you know, I'm, I'm, gr I'm dealing with. I mean, maybe I could <laughs> listen to that person, but I, I think it'd be hard for me. Now, would it change anything if their doctor had suggested that medical marijuana might help? even though it's not legal. Was it my husband? <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, d is your decision about marijuana, is that based on the law or based on some religious belief? I don't know the law with respect to marijuana. Um, I just know that I'm 100% against it. Um, I had somebody that was a close friend, um, it, uh, you know, he, he used it and it ruined his life and I'm just against marijuana completely. I, I don't think anybody should use it at all. All right, now, uh, and that would make you a, an impartial jury in this, juror in this matter? Of course not. Okay, so you're saying that you can be fair and impartial in determining the credibility of a witness who, it'll come out, uses miracle, medical marijuana even though it's, Ill, <laughs> it's illegal in Georgia. <laughs> Is that right, what you're saying, that you can be a fair and impartial juror even though the witness will say that he uses miracle, medical, medical marijuana? Um, well, I don't, I would try to be, but it might be hard for me. Okay, thank you, Ms. Mark. All right, so now we're sort of on the fence, right? Is this going to be a juror who we can strike for calls? Y'all wanna do a show of hands for calls? All right, I see, out of the 20 people in here, I see about six. Uh, any thoughts as to why we can, we could strike this person for calls? And with the microphone, we need to go back to those people. And uh, Ms. Osborne, right here, has a comment. If you had stopped the questioning right after she said, no, I would have a real hard time with anyone who uses marijuana, then you would have for cause. But since at the end of it she said, oh, I would try very hard to be objective, most judges are going to take that as that's close enough. Okay, so as a, as a matter of experience, you have found 
that the judges are going to try to get jurors into the box as opposed to allow them to easily be struck for cause. Yeah. Uh, and I would say that would be, especially if you've got a situation where you've got an eligible juror, a limited number of people to strike, and you've got to have 12 that ultimately end up in the box, judges are not going to be overly liberal in allowing you to strike for cause. Uh, any other thoughts as to why this might be a for-cause strike, a good for-cause strike? Anybody back there? Who had their hand up? The key criteria for a juror is the ability to uh, evaluate the evidence impartially and the witness and the prospective juror has said that it would be very difficult for her to do so. So even though she said she would try, she was not at all um, compelling in terms of saying that that success, that that would be a successful effort. And uh, I, that's what I, that's one of the things I picked up on the final few statements of this juror is that there was not, even though the, the, the discussion about marijuana had taken place, a lot of times jurors will say affirmatively, yes, I can be fair and impartial despite this somewhat prejudicial view that I have. Whereas this one only said basically maybe, maybe I can be impartial. And so uh, I would say this would be a, a, a situation where the judge has to make a judgment call as to whether they will strike that, allow that juror to be stricken for cause. So let's assume that the judge does not allow a strike for cause. What do you do as a lawyer? Do you, you what, I think what you have to do is you have to find out everything you can about all the other prospective jurors and then decide, given the fact that you've moved to strike this one for cause, who may be very offended by that or may not be, do you want to then do a peremptory strike or do you want to uh, uh, leave this juror on the, on the jury? So what we're, one of the things we're getting to here is there's not going to be a perfect jury at the end. All you can do is get the best juror, jury you can get. Uh, Just as a procedural thing, Henry, um, most of the judges ask uh, panel questions or l allow the attorneys to ask panel questions so what you might actually end up doing is asking all the jurors by saying something like uh, one of the witnesses in this case uh, takes marijuana uh, for medicinal purposes is there anyone in the jury pool who would have a problem with that please raise your hands and then you'd get eight or nine people raising their hands and you and your assistant would probably jot down who those people are, and then you would go to those individual questions that, that you asked. The ones you, you, were, you asked were the individual once you've identified all those jurors who, who would fall into that category. So Mr. Gepp has made a great point that I didn't affirmatively bring out, what I, which I should have earlier. Uh, you need to go in there with a very structured way of keeping track of who these people are and what their answers are to these Broader, broader questions which are asked, and it's a, a huge undertaking, but it has to be done very efficiently. Normally, you need more than two people, really, because if the, you know, it's very hard as the lawyer asking questions to also be writing down anything that's legible about individual jurors. So what I always go in with is a, a chart that hopefully somewhat matches the, the way the jurors will be situated in the courtroom. Uh, try to get the names of the jurors into the boxes uh, based on the questionnaires before you actually start questioning them. And then maybe have, pre with respect to questions you know you're going to ask, go have the questions in those boxes so all you have to do is put a check or an X next to those questions so you can get as much information as possible in the first round of, as he says, all panel questions so you can then do follow-up questions. And the other thing is, Generally speaking, if you can, try to get information about the whole set of jurors before you have to start striking people off 
for one reason or another because if you ask this one, you may think it's a marginally bad situation and if you, and then and if you strike her and then find out there's a really terrible person you definitely don't want the jury down the road, you might be stuck. You might have a situation where there are not enough jurors left or you might not actually be able to get that person struck for cause. You may have run out of peremptory strikes, etc. So it's a it's a uh, definitely an information overload, you know, drinking from a pipeline, a uh, fire hose, as soon as you start asking these people questions. And sometimes the problem is you can totally misinterpret what they mean by raising their hand in response to questions. And sometimes only good follow-up questions will reveal that this person is actually a wonderful juror, even though they sounded like they were going to be terrible based on the way they were raising their hands. Sometimes it's just the opposite. You think they didn't raise their hand, they're going to be fine, and then you uh, find out they're going to be a, a, an awful juror. So uh, as a matter of uh, practice, you know, keep eye contact with the people. It's not just what they, what they say will be what's written down, but a grimace on their face or something of that nature might be much more telling than uh, the actual thing they say, like you might ask uh, somebody, you know, given your circumstances of your husband, uh, you know, suffering from cancer, are you going to be able to do a five-week trial? And they may say yes, while at the same time they're acting like they're about to vomit, you know, uh, or looking like they're going to vomit. So uh, you want to try to keep, basically be very personable and very real with the people. Now one, one of my notes in here is uh, I think you pretty much have to be genuinely yourself when you're going through this uh, process. If you try to be a showboater or uh, Perry Mason, somebody you've seen on TV rather than yourself, this group of people is going to make an assessment of you real early on and if, and if you're not credible to them in the process of going through voir dire, you'll probably never be credible to them for the entire case. So uh, keep that in mind uh, while, you're, while you're doing this. Now, uh, yes, ma'am, we have a microphone. I was just going to say, you also don't want to um, come off as unorganized to the jury because I had a situation where I was a prospective juror. We're going through voir dire and it was probably the second round of questioning before one of the attorneys realized that um, people's uh, place of employment and whether they were married, that information had been given to them. So while the other, the other attorney was looking at it and asking questions based on that, this other person was kind of dragging it out. And so once the attorney who knew realized the other attorney didn't know and told him, it kind of made him look, you know, unorganized and, and a little slow in front of the jury, and I think everybody kind of let out a sigh, like, you know, here we go with this guy. So you just don't want to have those impressions made early on. Well, that's a very good point. Now, one, there's also a, a difference between what the jury expects you to have had an opportunity to do and what you actually had an opportunity to do, and that is a point that can be made during the time of your initial discussions with the jury, for instance, you know, especially if you've got a big veneer of 48 people and you got those jury questionnaires only five minutes before the jury, you know, filters in and so all you've had a chance to do is just fly through the, the uh, thing and maybe put them in two stacks, likely, unlikely or something like that. Uh, you can mention early on. Now, I have been getting, given these questionnaires, but I only got them five minutes before you came in, so please forgive me if I ask you a question that's already been answered, because I did not have the opportunity to memorize all these, and I've never seen you before. I didn't know who was who, etc. People, I think, will be generally forgiving if you give them a reason to, <laughs> to be forgiving of you, uh, and you give it to them in advance of them already making the assessment that you're adult. So. Uh, now, uh, you know, in our situation, since we're mainly doing commercial uh, cases uh, and sometimes of great complexity, there's a difficulty in figuring out just how capable a juror is going to be in understanding the uh, circumstances. So 
you can try to come up with things that will help you do that. One of which obviously, well not necessarily obviously, but hopefully would be the level of education of a juror. Uh, another one would be obviously the type of education the person has. You know, if it's a highly complex matter involving technical <laughs> things, then somebody that's a physics major may be better prepared to handle at least some of the subject matter than somebody that has a, a pure liberal arts degree. But what you may find is that a very small percentage of the prospective jurors have any sort of uh, education above high school. So then you have to try to figure out what the people have done since they had their formal education uh, to better themselves, become, become brighter, exercise their brains. And you can do that by asking questions about, you know, uh, what sort of, you know, who watches the Discovery Channel or Nova or, or, or the History Channel or other than, other than uh, Antiques Roadshow or whatever. Uh, try, to, try to go through uh, questions that are open, non-offensive, yet will give you some idea. Now, how do you avoid uh, by asking one juror things about themselves, how do you avoid making the other juror totally mad at you for asking this one about these questions? Any ideas there? You know, I, that's, that's, my, that's my hardest, uh, that's one of the hardest things I can think of. You got this room full of people. Oh, we got a comment over here, good. There are several ways you can do it. If they're very sensitive questions, you can try and have them answered in a questionnaire in writing so you don't have to do it openly in front of the court. You can ask the judge um, for permission to ask certain questions outside the presence of other jurors. In other words, you get an introductory show of hands on a relatively inoffensive question, and to the extent you need to follow up, you ask the court to excuse the rest of the jurors. Uh, or you have to make your disclaimer. Uh, you apologize for questions that appear to be sensitive, and you need to put it in context so the jury understands why you appear to be probing. Um, uh, now that I've got the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is the best day of my life when somebody else is anxious to talk about something. If you want me to, I taught this for eight years, and I read a million articles on, first of all, I say voir dire rather than voir dire, but trying to go through my class notes, following up on a lot of the things you said. First of all, when I would teach the course on voir dire, I'd first ask the question, does anybody know what voir dire means? Anybody? And there'd always be somebody who took French to speak the truth. That's correct. That's actually Latin that came through for me. That's the one use in 30 years. And I also point out that in the United Kingdom, there's only one voir dire question that's asked. And the question is, can you give a fair hearing to both the Crown and the defense? That is the entire sum and substance of voir dire in the United Kingdom. And I, I write on the blackboard, WYSIWYG. W-H-Y-S-I-G-G, -G. I think that's the right acronym, to emphasize that what you see is what you get, that I try to tell students it's not jury selection, it's jury deselection. You're never going to get a perfect jury, you're never going to get an impartial jury, that's an absolute pipe dream. You're trying to identify those jurors who are most likely to hurt you, and you're trying to identify jurors who can think, because whether you're a plaintiff or a defendant, everything I have read convinces me that you want as many leaders on that jury as possible, you do not want lemmings. Following up on, on exactly what you said, a lawyer has four opportunities to testify at any trial. The first one is voir dire. Then you have opening statement, cross-examination, and closing argument. If you don't use those opportunities, you are doing a disservice to your client. And what you're trying to do in voir dire is get the jury to believe you are honest and you are likable. Because if you are honest and you believe in your client, hopefully the jury is going to say, this lawyer is honest, this lawyer is likable, he believes in his client, therefore I should believe in the client. And it's critically important that you do not talk down to the jury, to the, to the veneer. Never say something like, if you are selected to the jury, because it sounds like you have this great God-given power to select and deselect, and you need to make the, the panel comfortable. There's no such thing as a wrong answer. 
you know, I, I like you as a person regardless of your answers, and I'm looking for what you really, over and over again, both of you use the term feel. And when you read the literature, it emphasizes that you should always pose your Vordaer questions in terms of emotion, feel, react, respond, not what do you think because you, you, know, you get a lot more information from the emotional side of a person rather than the cognitive side. Uh, and you did that exactly the way all the literature says you should do it. When you talk about, when you talk about <laughs> for cause, if, if the court will let you do your for cause challenge outside the presence of the jury, that's preferable. What's the golden rule when, when you challenge for cause? The one thing you can never forget, if you're gonna challenge for cause, you better have a preemptory strike in your back pocket um, because f to go through the analysis, once you have challenged for cause in the presence of that juror, you've got to have a preemptory strike in your back pocket to use if you need it. Um, if you're going to use your preemptory strike, mm, how, do you, how do you say to the, to the juror and the court that you're going to use it? What, what wording do you use? Oh, I have to be on the spot here. I would, I would say we probably uh, say we exercise peremptory strike number two as to juror number five. All right. Something like that. What the literature suggests <laughs> is that you try and say something like, uh, Your Honor, we, we thank juror number X for his or her service and we excuse the juror. Try and keep it as absolutely benign as possible. Um, and what you said is fine, but uh, the suggestion is you thank the juror, first of all, for answering the questions honestly, and we, we excuse the juror. We don't exercise our preemptory right, we just excuse the juror, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, uh, uh, can uh, Don interject for a second? No, 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 let's keep it going. <laughs> Anybody that raises their hand that excitedly, I want to take it. I don't want to turn off that fountain. Um, it was awesome. But um, my experience with jury trials is limited compared to yours, Mickey, obviously. But what I've, what I've found is that the, the judge has been accommodating of that concern about uh, exercising the strikes, and it's, it's always been a confidential thing. Uh, on striking for cause, we always have, there's always a sidebar, and you talk to the judge, we'd like to, we think juror number 21 should be stricken for cause because of X, Y, and Z, and the others, usually the other lawyer will object, and the judge will consider it. All that's done without the jurors hearing, the veneer hearing anything about it. And then also with the peremptories, you'll have a clip, you know, some sort of a clipboard usually going back and forth between the two sides, and under the Superior Court rules, I think you get one minute to do your peremptories, and the, the jurors have no idea who's striking whom, and all that goes to the judge, and then the judge processes any strikes for cause, as well as the peremptories, and says, okay, jurors number, and he goes through the 12 and says, they're the, they're the jury, and the rest are excused. So they don't even know who struck whom. Obviously, if the judge will do that, that's the best procedure, but not all judges will do that. And in, in, I just finished reading a Gresham book, and apparently in, in Mississippi, the way, the way they do it is the plaintiff has to exercise all of his or her preemptory strikes first. So there's, there's no going back and forth, which, which again, echoing Randy's point, is you need to know the procedure before you walk into court. The, the other three notes that I have um, that I'm going to just mention, um, don't, make any, don't ask any of the venar to promise you anything. Uh, because the literature suggests that some folks get offended if you ask the panel, will you promise to be fair, or will you promise to do this, or anything. They don't want you to be asking them for any promises. Uh, and the question about notes, ideally, the, the lawyer who's a asking the question shouldn't be taking any notes at all because that appears to be distracting to the panel. You should have as many folks as you need taking the notes for you. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of discussion about how much eye, t eye contact is good, how much eye contact is bad. Um, Probably you shouldn't uh, oogle a juror. Right. <laughs> uh, and, and, do and don't send any subliminally negative messages. For example, could you follow the law even if you disagree with it? You know, or could you disregard this or could you disregard that? I can understand why there may be a purpose for that, but the negative is you're really sending a subliminal message, subliminal message, easy for you to say, that there are 
serious problems with your case, and you're going to ask the juror to, you know, to ignore all the deficiencies in your case. Um, yeah, it might be better to say something along the lines of, when you find the evidence to be persuasive, can you rule upon it, or something like that. And like I, what I like, instead of saying, can you be fair, because that's kind of a silly question, you know, can you follow the judge's instructions, can you be fair? What I jotted down here is, what do you think about a system that asks people to decide what is right and fair? Because you're kind of telling them that's what this is all about, is be right and be fair, rather than directly confronting them with, can you be fair? In, anyway, those are my two cents worth. Debbie has a comment. Um, just following up on, on um, a couple of things, but your question was how you ask intrusive questions without upsetting the jurors next to them. I think that was the last question you asked. Um, I spent seven years prosecuting sex crimes on the Cherokee Indian Reservation in North Carolina. Um, so I spent a lot of time asking jurors about um, sex crimes. Um, and one of the ways that I found was the best way to get into it was do the, the overall panel question, have you or any member of your family or a close friend been a victim of a crime? And you have to use that or close friend in order to take it outside any identifiable realm right. of right. people? And then once they'd raise their hands, then I could go in and say, all right, without getting into too many details, do you think it was handled fairly? Do you think the government did a good investigation? Did you have any problems with uh, how it was resolved? And, and sometimes I would just ask, uh, you know, do you mind telling me, um, did the government win and do you think that was fair? Or, or any of, of those kind of things. And There's some courts that won't let you ask what was the outcome of a previous right. circumstance. Yeah, well, I was also in one of those jurisdictions where I had to, um, being with the government, I had to exercise my peremptories first. Um, so I, I kind of got used to that. But um, also did a lot of um, explaining to them just f flat out, um, have you or, or, you know, family or close friends been a victim of a crime that was or was not reported, specifically a sex crime. We're going to be talking a lot about child abuse. We're going to be talking a lot about body parts. We're going to be talking a lot about, and I would just tell them up front, here's, here's the kind of evidence you're going to hear. And I always learned to take very seriously and pay a lot of attention who was the alternate. Because at least twice a year, um, dur every year that I did this, at least twice I would have a juror after the first day of testimony call the judge and say, I did not disclose when I should have that I was a victim of a sex crime, never reported it, I can't sit on this jury any longer. So we'd always, at least twice a year, we'd end up with a, um, an, an alternate juror. And al along those lines, uh, a circumstance can happen during trial where you do have alternates. These are the extra people that are in the jury box who are not going to be able to vote and deliberate at the end of the trial unless something happens to the official jurors. And um, let's say a circumstance happens where one of the jurors, an official juror, says, all of a sudden I've got this problem in the middle of the trial. Uh, you might need to do a voir dire of that person in the middle of the trial, usually in camera, in other words, just with the judge, about the circumstance where you got to determine whether this person is going to stay or this person is going to go. And then in some instances you have a situation where you don't have much choice because the person will report a problem and the judge is just going to say that that juror is gone. It could be a, a, a medical problem, could be some overriding issue that's distracting the juror to, to the extent that the judge doesn't believe the juror should continue on. Uh, we actually had that in our recent trial. We lost two jurors in one night to medical problems and another juror to a uh, logistical issue associated with uh, her, you know, taking care of her family. So, uh, which when you get numerous weeks into a trial and your juries start going away one by one, uh, makes you extremely nervous. <laughs> And, and, and you, you hope you did as good a job as you think you did <laughs> alternate. That, that sort of leads to an issue which is uh, something I'll take up briefly is uh, if you have an alternative juror, 
should you try to convince the judge not to release that alternate until uh, as far into the trial as possible? And my thought is yes. In other words, uh, you can have a judge who gets to the point where the jury goes out to deliberate and then releases the alternate juror at that point. I would advocate, and the, I think 9-11-47 allows it, for that juror to be set aside, basically put in escrow for the, deter for the deliberations by the jury in case something happens to a juror while they're deliberating. Uh, and then the person can come in and complete deliberations. I don't know how that would work functionally, but if you've invested a tremendous amount of money in a long trial, the last thing you want is for your jury to disappear at the last minute due to whatever reason. Uh, okay, so uh, we've talked about many aspects, and uh, thank you so much for each of your participation. Mickey, that was fabulous. I did have a question as a, uh, this thought is, if you're not taking notes, then uh, how do you get the information from the assistant to the person who's asking the questions of the juror and making the decision, uh, given the, the speed at which a trial is going? Do you have any... You were saying the juror, the person asking the question shouldn't be taking the notes, but usually that's the same person who has to make the decision based on the answers that aren't written down on the piece of paper the person has. But wouldn't you normally do the entire voir dire and then have X number of minutes to make your decisions, at which point you're getting all the feedback from your associates? Okay, the answer is that would be wonderful if that's the case. And my, I've had both circumstances where and I hate it, I absolutely hate it, where the judge says, all right, you've asked your questions, start your striking. Really? Is that what you're and with no, and uh, Debbie has a comment. Uh, um, the way I've always found is whoever's sitting at the council table with me, if I've got an associate who's there, um, because I need to know the information. When I, when I do the, have any of you been victims of a crime, for example, um, and they all raise their hand, I, I don't take a list of who they are, and I don't, Sometimes I remember who's next, but I, a lot of times I have to look around and say who was next on the list. Um, if I don't have an associate, I put the client to work. Oh, I definitely keep put everybody to work. Clients need to be, to the extent a client is savvy enough, they need to participate in this anyway because they may know something you don't know. Like that person is actually best friends of, especially if you're in a small town. That person is best friends of this person, if, and if he's best friends of that person, I definitely don't want him on my jury. Something along those lines. Uh, let, let me, on that point, the client, I think the client's real important because you're a lawyer there who's maybe not in touch with how the, the people in the community are. Your client may well be in touch with the people in the community. They may not know anybody there, but they'll say that, like for example, Natalie's kind of like me. I ha I sort of feel good about her, and you as a as a, a learned attorney may not have those kinds of feelings. So I think it's real important to get the client involved in selection of the right. And along those lines, to the ex this is definitely an art. There's no formula, uh, but you got to take into account things that you wouldn't like to admit that you need to take into account. Like if you have a really attractive client you might want, and that person's going to be testifying for a long time, you might want somebody on the jury you think is going to find your client really attractive uh, or, or something of that nature. Uh, is it, because uh, in fact in the more recent trial we had we actually rotated in eye candy on a regular <laughs> basis on purpose uh, because we wanted to have the, the jurors paying attention to every aspect of the matter we could. <laughs> I've got Randy uh, laughing so much I can't get the question out of him now. Uh, all right, Natalie actually has something while, while Randy is so stunned he can't talk. I have a quick question. Microphone right there. I have a quick question that's for anybody here, but as far as the apps, like I know that there's an iPad app that you can use for, the, for jury selection to help you so you can identify who the jurors are and et cetera. Does anybody recommend that? And has anybody ever used a specific app or software that they think is very effective? All right, I see a lot of heads sh shaking. However, uh, we did actually use that app on an iPad uh, 
at the my wife typed in all the information she could get as fast as you can get it in. The problem is you actually need a little bit of a luxury amount of time to get the jury questionnaires in advance, get all the information into the app. If you can get them the night before instead of the morning of the trial, you can get all that information in and you have a framework auto automatically organized that helps you track the people through the process. Randy had a final one, comment. One of the points I think is important in good jury selection is try to imagine what characteristics you want in your jurors before you get into doing, going through the process. You know, do you want accountant types? Do you want very liberal folks, sociologists? Do you want older, more conservative people? Who would, what are the characteristics that would be helpful to you in a juror? In a juror? And therefore, you can start looking for those in advance. And, and there are studies out there that, that give you an idea on different kinds of cases, what, who makes the better jurors. You can talk to other lawyers in the office by going over the case and getting their opinions on who might be a good juror. Those are all, so when you there, there, you're looking for those characteristics. Right, and if you don't have any criteria laid out, it's sort of like a business having a mission statement. If you don't have something to use as a go-by, you're just going to be totally floundering when you have to make your decisions. So. Think about it in advance. This is not an afterthought thing. At the end of the day, this is the jury that you are deselecting, uh, and the jury gets to make so many decisions on your case that it should not be an afterthought. It should be perhaps a primary thought. And so a lot of time and effort should be put into uh, coming up with how you're going to go about doing the voir dire. And, uh, what criteria you want to apply and how you're going to communicate yourself uh, with those people. And so, thank you very much for attending Quillian's Current.